Uh, come on in, everyone. Uh, my name is Fraser, and this is my colleague Pierre. And uh, today, we're going to be giving you a short, sort of jam packed introduction to the world of back end building with LLVM. Uh, like I said, there's a lot to cover, uh, so we might go a bit quickly. We've got 55 minutes, and if you could leave any questions to the end, that would be brilliant. Uh, so you'll hear a lot more from me in the coming slides, but I'm going to pass you first over to Pierre, and he's going to start us off. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so the, our goal for today is to give you a crash course uh, about the LVM backend so that you can implement your own targets, like for your own architecture. And no matter how much or how little experience you have with the backend. Uh, obviously, if you know some, then it will be easier, but we hope that you'll learn something either way. Um, we'll try to give you a lot of how-tos so that if you want to implement something in your backend later on, uh, you, you know what options you have. And also, we'll try to give you a lot of solutions for the common problems you might encounter um, to make it easier for you. And we want you to get started as quickly as possible. So we've created a really simple target for this tutorial. And you can basically look at the source and see how it's done. Uh, you could try compiling complicated programs with it and see where it fails and why and so on. Or you could just take the source and just rename it and use that as a base for your own target. Um, so before we start, I, we thought we would give you some kind of resources uh, that we uh, might be useful uh, to have uh, when you're creating your target. So the first one is, uh, I think, it would be quite useful if you know about LVMIR because it's kind of the input to your backend. So you want to know about that, and there's a really good uh, documentation document on the LVM website. So uh, check it out. And the second one is a tool called, called x.py that will allow you to show to visualize graphs comp uh, generated by the compiler. It's really useful. Um, third item will be to uh, check out the source code for our targets that we uh, uploaded on GitHub. And finally. We have a lot of slides, and as Fraser said, we probably won't have the time to cover all the details. So uh, if you're interested, you can download the slides after the talk and just use them as a reference. Um, so let's get started. Um, we'll start with telling you about, uh, a bit about the backend, uh, how this kind of structure it has, the different re representations. And then we'll tell you how to describe your targets to LLVM. And uh, after that, we'll tell you uh, kind of like how to for specific tasks that you'll probably have to uh, implement and finally how, what to do if something goes wrong. Uh, so let's start with the uh, background. So as I've said, we've created a really simple target for this, example, for this tutorial, which, we've based, which is basically a subset of the ARM architecture. And we, we think it's really uh, kind of neat uh, architecture, so it's, uh, it's quite easy to understand at the beginning. Um, and well, we've called it like because it's a reference to ARM. So it's really simple. We have uh, 10 general purpose registers. We can store your favorite uh, values in. Uh, you can use a stack pointer if you want to use stack. Uh, you have a return address register if you want to call a function, which is kind of useful. And you have really simple instruction like arithmetic, or you can copy these values between registers. You can uh, load constants into a register, and then you can access memory with loads and stores, or you can do branches. Um, so, on this slide, we've shown a really simple example, a function that just takes two uh, integers, just adds them together, and uh, returns the result. So we'll use this example throughout the tutorial. Um, and if you want to generate the matching code shows, uh, shown at the bottom of the slide, um, you need to know in which registers uh, the arguments for the function are passed and how they are returned. And uh, this is called the cooling convention, and it's in leg it's really simple. It's just it's basically just like ARM. So the first four arguments are passed in R0 to R3, and any further arguments are passed on the stack. And the R0 is uh, return value. So if you have a look here at the assembly, you can see that two arguments, R0, R1, return value, R0. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so let's have a look at the, um, we told you about the targets we'll use. Now let's have a look at how it fits uh, within the LVM backend. Um, so it has a pretty conventional pipeline structure, which means it basically, you give, you, you give it a program as input, it will transform it many times, and maybe it will make it like smaller or faster, depending on the optimizations. And basically it starts very uh, target independent, and it will go uh, more and more target specific. And 
at different stages of the pipeline, uh, the compiler will use different representation, so it will transform from one representation to another. And uh, the reason we tell you this is because it's quite, if you know which representation uh, you are currently using, you, you roughly know where you are in the pipeline, and it tells you well, what to expect, even though maybe you don't know well, all the stages of the pipeline, you know like, how it works. Um, and what's important to know is that uh, depending on the representation, you'll have different namespace for instructions. So uh, one, in, one representation could have one set of operations that are defined by LMVM, for example, or for your target. Um, so be aware that even though they might seem similar, they are not uh, the same. And you can, um, you can check out this process using the print after all flag uh, passed to LLC, and you will see whenever LVM will modify your program in IR or MI form, uh, you will see what happens. Um, so first, look, let's have a look at the most simple representation. The first one, which is a higher level one, the IR, uh, which I think most of you will be familiar about. Uh, so it's linear, which means it's just uh, a list of instructions, like where you have one instruction and another. And it's very high level. Uh, it's almost completely target diagnostic. And most instructions will define values. Uh, and then these values can be used as operands for other instructions. Uh, the values are typed with pretty high level types like i32 or float or vectors. And they are defined only once because it's a SA form. And you, at this point, we don't have any registers. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see the same C example uh, in IR form. So one of the first things that the backend will do is take your IR and transform it in a uh, form more suited for, for your backend. And, and this is called the selection DAG uh, representation. So as you can see from the name, it's a graph representation. And on the right, you have the, um, sorry, you have the same uh, program, but in a uh, selection DAG form. So as you can see, um, the nodes in this graph are basically operations operations, which is basically just another name for instructions. And at this point, the instructions are mostly target diagnostic. So LVM defined a set of instructions or operations and which have semantics and they are taken from the ISD namespace. And as before, this instruction or operations uh, produce values and these values can be used as uh, input for other uh, nodes. And uh, whenever you have this uh, one node using a value from another node, then you have dependencies. And the most common kind of dependency is uh, data. So when you have a really simple type, uh, you have the dependency, but uh, if the value you are referencing is a chain, then it's an uh, order dependency, which are used if you have like um, instruction with side effects, uh, for example, like loads and stores, then you have chains, and they are used to preserve the ordering of this uh, instruction with side effects in your graph. And the last kind of uh, dependency is called the glue dependency, which basically means uh, when you have two nodes that are glued together, no other node can be inserted uh, in the middle. So it's basically used for scheduling to make sure two instructions are stuck together in, in your DAG. And um, a really closely related representation is the mashing DAG graph. And it's very similar to the one we've seen before. And the most important distinction is that the nodes are not uh, high-level operation anymore. They are target instructions. And these instructions are the result of instruction selection. Um, and as we've seen before, they use different namespace. In this case, it would be the leg namespace, which is the namespace for all uh, target instruction for our targets. But other than this, as they are very similar. So here we have a comparison of the two tags. So the one before instruction selection, and the one afterwards. So you can see here the only difference is that you have this add node here, uh, which is a high level LVM add. And here you have the add RR add, which is specific to our target. Um, later on in the backend, after you've done instruction selection, um, the LVM will take your DAG and schedule it. And as part of sh this scheduling, um, it, will create, it will transform it to another representation called machine instruction. And this uh, representation is uh, linear again, so it, you have an order for instruction, so you don't have a graph. And uh, something that's quite different with the previous representation is that it's not typed. So the um, operands, your instructions, don't use types, but they use uh, restore classes instead, or other kind of um, operands. 
And most of these instructions are actually target specific with just a few exceptions. And so here we have a really simple example of MI uh, block. And you can see uh, this add RR uh, instruction with the registers we've seen earlier. And here kill just means uh, this register is the last use of this, of this value. Um, so now, uh, Fraser will tell you about how to create a target with LVM. Yes, I will. Can you still hear me? Yeah, OK. Is that working? What? OK, sorry. Uh, so we've had our background, and let's get stuck into it. So before we begin, you're going to have to know a lot about your target architecture. You're going to have to know the registers and how they're subdivided. Uh, you're going to have to know the calling conventions that you adhere to. And most important are the instructions. So for every instruction in your architecture, you're going to have to be able to define uh, what it outputs and what it takes as input, its semantics, how it looks in assembly, how it's encoded into binary, and a lot of other things that uh, we won't have time to get into. So basically, you're going to have to go away, spend a few days or weeks reading your ISA manual. And then once you've had a good old time doing that, you'll come back, and you'll want to start feeding this information to LVM. So LVM needs to know a lot of information about your target to generate code for you. This is uh, perhaps unsurprising, um, given how complex processors are these days. Um, and entering all this information manually could get pretty repetitive and menial, boring, and least of all, error prone. But luckily, LVM has a solution with which we can greatly simplify this process. And so we come to man's other best friend, uh, sorry dog livers, TableGen. So TableGen is LVM's domain-specific language. And it allows us to concisely describe parts of our target architecture while uh, minimizing, minimizing repetition and doing the ugly parts for us. And so we'll be using TableGen to define our registers, calling conventions, and our instructions. Uh, so in order to get anything useful out of our TableGen definitions, we have to run what are known as TableGen backends on our source. And a single TableGen file can mean many different things and can be interpreted in many different ways to different backends. So for example, we'll see in the coming slides that a leg instruction is defined exactly in one place in our table gen. Um, but if we run a backend such as uh, ASM writer on this instruction, it will generate code for us to help us print it into assembly. Whereas if we take a backend such as ASM uh, matcher, I believe it's called, this will generate code which helps us read this instruction from assembly. So it's the reverse side of the coin, if you will. And these backends generate um, dot .inc files at compile time. And these dot .inc files are then included by our C++ source, which the rest of the backend is coded in. And depending on the backend used, um, these dot .inc files, which are C++, I should say, uh, can range from sort of simple functions, which help you out, or they can as the name suggests, generate these huge, undecipherable tables. And it's these complex cases where we're really glad to have TableGen do this work for us, the heavy lifting. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot of uh, examples of TableGen and its source and how it works uh, in the coming slides. But if you do want any reference or links, please check out the URLs um, in this slide. So enough of that. Let's get started. Uh, we'll start with our register set. Um, there are you know, core component of our backend. And we'll do this with TableGen, as I said. And so TableGen provides us with this class called register. We inherit from that, and we define our own sort of target leg reg. Uh, and we fill in a bunch of information which we need to know, such as what it looks like, um, its name, uh, you know, its encoding, things like that. It's fairly straightforward stuff. Uh, you can, might be able to imagine that defining a whole bank of these registers, you know, 128 or even more, we get pretty tedious in this sort of list-like fashion. Uh, but luckily, TableGen provides us with this syntactic sugar with which we can simplify trivial definitions. And that's in the code sample at the top. But once we've got that out of the way, what we want to do is define these register classes. And these uh, dictate how these registers on the leg um, or your target architecture are subdivided. So for example, you'll have instructions that take floating point registers or 8-bit integer registers. And so that's what these register classes are for. And so in the code snippet on the bottom, 
we define our general purpose register class for the leg target. We add in all our R0 to so R9 and our stack pointer. It's that simple. And so once we've got out this, this out of the way, let's move on to the calling convention. Now, Pierre's already um, sort of walked us through the leg calling convention. And now it's our time to pass this information on to LVM via table gen. So a table gen calling convention is a, a list of predicates and actions. And it will determine, a given, a, like, for example, an incoming argument, what to do with it. So here, we define our leg calling convention, uh, where we pass the, four, the first four arguments via the registers, and then the rest go to the stack. And i8 and i16 integers are just promoted for simplicity. Um, so how does this calling convention sort of fit into the big picture, the grander scheme of things? Uh, well, let's have a look. So if we turn to our trusty add example, uh, you'll see the function foo in the top left. Hopefully you can see that. Takes our two arguments, uh, sums them, returns the result. And then the corresponding DAG for this is shown on the right. And we can see that um, we'd expect these uh, incoming arguments to be passed through registers, and we'd expect the return value to also be passed back through a register. And indeed, that's the case. The um, A, B, and C circled nodes are register nodes. So our assumption is correct. Great. Um, unfortunately, these nodes are defined out with the scope of this function's DAG. Um, because either they're passed through to the function or they're passed out from it. And so to do any computation on these nodes, we have to what's called lower them into the DAG via sort of helper nodes. Um, and th this isn't done for us. We have to define a few target hooks. And these are called lower formal arguments and lower return. Sorry. Uh, so let's have a look at the first one. Um, lower formal arguments, its job is to lower incoming arguments into the DAG. And it does this, in our case, by issuing these copy from register nodes. And then we can start working on them. And similarly, lower return um, lowers outgoing uh, values um, into the DAG so that we can process them. Um, the implementation is fairly straightforward. I won't really go through it. Uh, but you can always check out the source. Or you can check out this slide later. But what it does is, for each incoming argument, it'll assign it a location. And then depending on the location uh, and the calling convention, uh, it will issue a certain node, say, copy it from a register, or it will load it from the stack. Low return, very similar. Uh, you can guess how it works. Um, and then I also include lower call here on this third slide, um, simply because if your compiler or your architecture is fancy enough to support function calls, you have to implement this hook here. And it's basically a hybrid of the logic found in lower formal arguments and lower return. Um, but I'll sort of blaze through that for simplicity. And so we've got out of the way. And now I'll pass you back over to Pierre. And he's going to walk us through uh, starting getting into the meat of our implementation, which are the instructions. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Right, so as Fraser said, now we've defined our registers. And LVM knows about them. And we have everything we need to create to start defining our instructions, which are quite important if you want to generate machine code. Um, so let's define this add our instruction, which just takes two values in registers, adds them together, and stores the result in another register. So we'll use table gen again for this, and uh, we use this like instrument.td file. And there are three major things we have to define for each, each instruction, and we'll cover the two now and the third one later. So these important things are operands and then uh, instruction pattern for instruction selection. So the first thing you will want to define is the operands. Um, so each instruction can take either, uh, I mean, can take inputs or uh, uses, and also define some values or like output these values. And in table gen, this is um, marked by this out uh, list and ins list. So you see here, for each operand, we have to define its name. Uh, which re register class we use, or for other kind of reference, uh, maybe the immediate class or more complex classes. And as we said, uh, this is a table gen definition. Um, so that's pretty much it for the operand. It's quite simple. And the most important bit here is the selection pattern. So selection patterns are used to by LVM to match DAG nodes and then turn them into machine instructions. And there are different ways of, of doing this. Uh, one is to create a table gen pattern, like is shown here on the slide, 
or you can use uh, custom C++ code to do this uh, by hand. So let's see the most simple way of doing this, creating a pattern. Um, so it's quite a simple uh, syntax. So this pattern here uh, describes a, like part of the DAG. So it, we are trying to match this add node, with, which has two uh, input operands, source one and source two of type IC2. And this basically means that whenever LVM will see one of these nodes in the DAG, it will know to emit the add R insertion. And since we've kind of linked this uh, operand here with the MI operands, uh, LVM will know to take the operands of this DAG node and then transfer them to the new MI instruction. Um, so that's good, but sometimes you want to use uh, constants in your IR. I mean, pretty much every program has constants. And if we try to uh, use our uh, backend at this point and compile a, a really simple program that uses constants, you'll get an error like this one. Uh, LVM cannot select. So this basically means that LVM doesn't know what to do with this constant DAG node. And what we have to do is tell LVM what to do uh, to lower it as a node. So for example, uh, this constant, we want to generate a move low insertion to take the constant and load it to the register. So let's see how we can do this. Um, so this is quite similar uh, as what we've done for the RR. We just define another instruction, move low, which has just a destination and a source. And we just say, well, if you have a 32 bit immediate, you can just set it to this uh, destination, destination register. And then whenever we compile this IR program here, then we get the output we want. We have this move low instruction that just takes a constant and loads it to the register, and then the add as before. Um, but sometimes, uh, your ISA will have instructions where you can actually encode the constant inside the uh, encoding of the instruction. So it's usually called uh, immediates. And well, you will want to uh, take advantage of this. So here, we, are, we want to define this RRI instruction that uh, takes the register as input and 8-bit uh, constant. And in order to uh, match the DAG nodes that have this 8-bit constant, we'll have to define this uh, operand uh, class. So we define the ic 2 bit operand that is constrained here. And this will only, uh, and as if we define this insertion here, it means uh, this insertion will only be used whenever the constant fits the range. And if we compile the same IR that before, then we get the insertion we wanted. And we don't have the uh, move low insertion that loads the constant. Uh, sometimes you, I say, will have complex instruction that uh, perform multiple operations, and in this case, you want to uh, target multiple nodes in your DAG and turn turn all of these nodes in one single instruction. So a very simple example would be multiply and add, which is for our targets is the MLA instruction here. And what's important to know here is that in your selection pattern, you can actually embed uh, one node into another. So we have this MLA node here. That is the whose result will be the input of this add node. So whenever LVM will see this ML nodes where the result is fed into the add nodes, and it knows that he has to generate this MLA instruction here. Um, so let's have a look how this looks uh, in DAGs. So on the left hand side here, you have the selection DAG before insertion selection. You have uh, add nodes, ML nodes, and then two things could happen. Um, if we didn't define this MLA instruction or and it was pattern then each node will be lowered as a single instruction. So uh, the mul uh, operation will be lowered into mul instruction, add to add r. But as you can expect, if we define this MLA, then LVM will take these two nodes and then just generate one instruction. And the source operands here are uh, preserved. Um, this I don't think we'll have time to cover. But basically, uh, you will have to implement some hooks if you want to uh, use values on the stack. But I think, yes, now it's <laughs> time for Fraser to tell you about um, specific how to for specific tasks. Yeah, OK. So up until now, um, we've been working with the internals of our compiler, the bowels, if you will. But now, what we really want to do is get some output from it so that we can pass it around and show off to our friends. And so I'll sort of uh, I'll help you through that now, first by going through instruction printing and then encoding. And so if we want to emit, um, sort of implement instruction printing for our leg backend, there's a few classes that we need to implement. And what's important to note here is that up until now, 
we've gone from IR, selection DAG, machine DAG, and we've arrived at machine instructions, or MIs. But this stage works at an even lower stripped down version called MC inst, machine code instructions. And so the ASM, this leg ASM printer takes our machine instructions, lowers them via MC inst lower, and then it passes it to a streamer, be that an ASM streamer for assembly or an object streamer for um, binary encoding, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, you probably guessed that we use table gen to define the instruction string, the assembly string. And that is provided via this ASM string field. Uh, it's well named. And then we go ahead and add to our add RR instruction uh, the following assembly string. And we say, given this instruction, this is how it looks when you print it to text. And so the dollar signs and their operands, they match up with the names. And it's all done for us. And so the table gen code will handle most of it for us. But you can think of these dollar sign operands as like a substitution parameter on which a target hook will get called. And we need to do the rest ourselves. And this hook is called print operand. Uh, you can guess what it does. So its job is to take an incoming operand of a machine instruction, or an MC int, sorry, and print it to a stream. And so here our implementation says, if it's a register, print out the name of the register. If it's an immediate, print out the immediate. There are other kind of operands, such as branch targets and so on. but. Um, you can check it out, it's quite simple. And that's all we really have to do. So if we take our good old uh, add example, our function foo is compiled to the following assembly for us. Uh, most of the directives are done via um, sort of you know, LLVM code. We can override it if we want to. But the most important thing is our instructions are um, emitted for us. Hurrah. But I know what you're thinking. Text, bit old fashioned. Ones and zeros, that's where it's at. So let's extend our backends and add binary emission. So we need a few new classes. They're in this list here. Uh, the sort of class hierarchy is fairly similar. You know, we take our machine instructions, lower them, pass it to this time an object streamer. So given a leg encoding, which is shown in the table above, um, so leg has a 32-bit instruction encoding. And this is an example for an ALU instruction, such as add. Uh, we can see that we've got 32 bits of information. We put opcode in you know, bits 21 to 24. All the operands go in their own places. And so we've got our nice add RR instruction. How can we get this result on the bottom where we've put the opcode for add in the right place and the register operands are all hooked in? Uh, yeah, table gen. So <laughs> uh, it provides us with this field of bits, which we call inst. Um, and as soon as we start, assigning various subfields of inst to uh, bit patterns, uh, LVM knows how to encode an instruction into binary. And so what we've gone here in this um, second example is just taken the static parts of our instruction coding and just done the bits that we know. Um, as you guess, this isn't the whole story. We need to encode our operands as well, or the instruction won't make sense. So it's a bit more nuanced, and that's why I left it to the second slide. If you want to um, add operand encoding to your instruction, what you have to do is define local bit fields with the same names as your operands, so source one, source one. And then once you assign this to another subfield of inst, uh, table gen will hook it up for you. I don't know why it doesn't just do it automatically, but I'm sure there's a good reason. Uh, and so the table gen generated code will emit all the bits it knows about. And then again, for these dollar opcodes, uh, operands, sorry, um, we'll get this hook called get machine op value, and that's called for us. So let's look at that. Uh, it looks a lot like print operands. It takes an operand, it encodes it into binary. Uh, registers, it gets the um, encoding value, the hardware encoding of the register. Um, immediates, they're simple. You just flush the immediate to the stream, uh, not to the stream, just, yeah. And so the table gen generate codes is really handy here because it'll take the result of this hook, it will chop off the bits it doesn't need, it will shift it up into the correct place, and everything's done for us. And so we don't have to worry about you know, bit fiddling or shifts and introducing bugs in that area. So thanks, table gen. Um, and once we've done that, we've got an ELF binary using some stock classes like um, ELF object emitter or whatever it is. Uh, 
and we're good to go. Um, unfortunately, though, not all operands are as simple to encode as registers and immediates. We might have things like branch targets. So if we branch somewhere forward in the instruction stream, we don't know how far we need to go until all instructions have been omitted. And so these things are called expressions. And so once we've exhausted the possibility of an operand being a register or an immediate, we go, OK, we need to handle this differently. And so we're provided with this vector of fix-ups. And what we do is we say, LVM, come back to us with this, calculate the address later, and um, you let us know. And so we push a fix-up into this vector and return a 0. And everything will be done for us later. Well, almost everything. And so first, we want to, what we want to do is define a target-specific fix-up. And the example that we'll use in the leg targets is um, branching to a 32-bit address. And now you'll probably know if we've got a 32-bit instruction encoding, we can't encode a 32-bit branch target in one instruction. So what we have to do, as in ARM, we split it up into the lower and upper uh, 16 bits and encode it into two separate instructions. Move the high, move the low. And so that's how that's done here. We define two specific fix-ups, um, which let us identify the kind of relocation that we're provided. So, once LVM has emitted all the instructions and it's calculated all the addresses and it's finalized the layouts of the sections, it'll come back to us and say, hey, I know you want this to be done for you. I've calculated the address. Do something with it. There are two target hooks that we need to do here. One's process fix-up value and one is uh, apply fix-up. And so the former's job is to take a relocated address and do something with it. So in the leg target, either we'd chop out the, um, we'd mask out the upper 16 bits, or we'd mask, the well, we'd shift out the lower 16 bits, depending on which instruction we need to fix up for. And then once that's done, we need to just patch it into the binary stream via apply fix up. And that's that. Um, and I'm going to pass you back over to Pierre, and he's going to expand our knowledge of the selection DAG. Right, so as we've seen before, the LVM backend will take your IR and then convert it to DAG and so on and then do the insertion selection. But sometimes these uh, nodes in, in your DAG, doesn't, they don't really fit your architecture. You want to change them somehow. And this section will tell you how you can do this. Um, so one of the first things you could do is that, well, we've seen that LVM defines a lot of operations for you. And, but maybe your target has something a bit more different that is not really covered. So you will want to create your own kind of DAG nodes. And this, this is uh, all about it. Uh, so, for example, we'll want to create uh, an insertion that will uh, load a certain bit constant uh, into your register. So, how can we do this? Um, well, there are a few things you need to do. You need to kind of uh, create an identifier, like opcode, for your uh, DAG nodes. And you have to do this in the like, ISD enumeration so that it kind of reserves an identifier. And then you have to update this get target no name uh, function so that you can print it out for debugging. And finally, you will need to add a couple table gen definitions. Um, so you'll need to define a type for uh, your nodes, so such as how many inputs it has, how many outputs, maybe some constraints for the types. Uh, and when you have defined this type, then you're ready to create your definition for your uh, DAG nodes, which is uh, at the bottom of the slide here. And in order to create this definition, you need to pass the uh, opcode, which is uh, in the like ISD namespace here, and the type. And finally, the final bit you'll need is this define some names that you can uh, later on reuse in your uh, insertion pattern. So that if you have some pattern, uh, you can generate uh, the insertion you want for it. Um, sometimes you have your DAG and you want to kind of modify it because it doesn't really fit your pattern, your target, sorry. And LVM provides you a really simple way to do this. So if you can tell it, well, if I have this kind of node for a power constant and that has a type i32, then I want to handle it myself. So you call this set operation uh, action function with the uh, relevant arguments, and then LVM will uh, call one of your hook with this node, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So usually what you would do, you would create a function called lower, and then the name of the opcode you want to, of the, of the DAG node you want to handle. So in this case, we'll create a function called lower constant, and then LVM will call this function for us, and then we can uh, transform the nodes how we want. And all of this happens in the target lowering class. 
Um, so let's see how we can implement this lower constant function. So this function takes a diagonal as input, which is called here op, and returns another node. So there are a few things you can do with this node. Um, usually you, would want, you will want to create a new node and return it. So in this case, LVM will take the old node and just replace it with a new node. Sometimes you don't want to do anything with it, so you'll just return the old node and LVM won't do anything to your DAG. Or you could return an empty node and then LVM will just say, well, okay, you're not, you don't support this kind of node, so I'll just simplify it, uh, perhaps create uh, new nodes that are handled by your target. And you can do uh, bits of this, so you can say, well, for one type, I really want to create a new node, for another type, I can just leave it as it is. So you don't have to uh, limit yourself with just one thing. And here is, a, for example, a simple implementation of this uh, function. Um, so, um, so yeah, if you want to uh, take one node of the DAG and then uh, transform it to something else, you want to create new nodes, and you just use a get node function. So it's pretty simple. You just pass it the opcode, the type of node, and it's apparent. So it's quite sim uh, simple. I won't take much time about this. And sometimes you have one. DAG node, and then you want to lower it into multiple instructions because your ISA doesn't support doing it in one instruction. So the example here is uh, you have a 32-bit constant, and uh, since we have 32-bit instruction, we, we cannot put the whole constant into, into our encoding, so we have to split it into two. Move low, uh, so we can use this move low and move high instruction that just takes the low part, loads it, loads it into the register, the high part, and so on. And so if we emit these two instructions, there, will, there is one thing we need to pay attention to. Um, we need to make sure the ordering is correct because the move low will clear the high part of your register. So if you do move high and then move low, you'll just have an empty high part. So you don't want that. And one solution for this is uh, to take the output of move low and use it as input for your move high. So this way it will force the encoding, force the ordering, sorry. So here, if, we have, if you want to load this uh, constant which has one in the high part and two in the low part, then we want to generate this kind of DAG here. So move low with constant two, and move high constant one. Um, so now we have to define this move high insertion because we've not defined before. And it's very similar to what we've done before, except we have this uh, extra operand here, this fake source. And it's not really a real, it's not a really a real operand in our ISA instruction. So what we have to do here, we have to make sure this source will be actually using same registers and the destination, otherwise you will have only half of your value. And in order to force LVM, the register locator, to do this, you have to use a constraint in table gen so that uh, LVM knows to use the same register for these two operands. Um, so now we have defined both instruction, and you want to generate these two instruction whenever this DAG node is used. And there are different ways you can do this. Either you can use custom C++ uh, code during instruction selection, and if you see this uh, DAG node, then you just create a your uh, two instruction nodes. Uh, but another way to do it is using a pseudo instruction as a kind of a placeholder. And since it's quite useful, let's see how it's done. Um, so um, you can define instruction which, has, which are quite similar to normal instruction, but that LVM will know that it's just a placeholder, so that it will go through the uh, compilation pipeline, and at some point will just be uh, transformed into different kind of instructions and then removed. Um, and since it's just uh, almost a normal instruction, you can define it in table gen, uh, except it has a I, uh, is pseudo flag, and you can use selection patterns, so it's quite nifty. And as I've said before, at some point you have to take your placeholder instruction and you have to create the real instruction. And uh, this is done in the expand post array pseudo hook, which just uh, takes the pseudo and then gets all the operands, uh, gets the uh, set to bit constant, and just split it into two. And when this is done, you can create your two insertion here using the proper registers. And when you're done with it, you can just delete the pseudo here. Um, so let's, let's have a look at an example. So at the top of the slide, there is a IR example where you want to add a, a constant that doesn't fit in a 16-bit uh, uh, move low insertion. And if we compile this after defining these two insertion and this pseudo insertion and implementing this hook, 
then we'll have this kind of output at the bottom here. Uh, so we have one instruction to load the low part and high part, and then it uh, adds uh, code just as, as before. And now let's, uh, Fraser will tell you all about what to do if something is, goes wrong. Uh, that was nice. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, as much as we might like to think, we compiler developers are not infallible. Uh, something probably will go wrong. And so we're here to help you when this happens. So the first thing to do if you're creating your backend and something goes wrong, um, I recommend, or we recommend rather, that you run the compiler with this special flag and try and find the path that introduced the issue. And this flag is dash print after all. And we've kind of been over it before, but the compiler will essentially, for every transformation of your program, emit um, a representation or a dump of it. And so you can sort of scroll through this log and try and understand the point at which something went wrong. And it will mention the pass that produced the output. And so once you've found the culprit, the bad pass, um, you want to rerun the compiler and dump only the debug information from the pass in question. And so you do that with this dash debug only and then pass it a string which identifies the pass. And you can find that by looking up the source file for the pass. And then near the top, there'll be this um, hash define debug type. And then this string here on the right is the one that you want to use. And so that's not all that goes wrong. Uh, I mean, this is sort of a printf debugging. And as great as it is, at one point, you're going to want to uh, open up a debugger. And luckily, LVM provides us with some nice functionality to inspect objects. Uh, so most of the objects you'll be working with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, such as instructions, basic blocks, and functions, um, they'll have this method called dump. And if you call dump on, say, an instruction, it will print out the instruction. It will print out the uh, name and its operands. And for a basic block, it will print out all the instructions in the basic block. You guessed it. And so this only really works with textual objects, you know, ones that can be represented via ASCII. Um, we've also got a lot of uh, objects in the back end, which we've seen, such as DAGs. And luckily, help is at hand, because if you call this view graph method on a DAG or a CFG, um, X dot, assuming you've got it installed, will pop up a wee window. And then you can zoom in, zoom out, look at the nodes and how they interact. And that's really useful. And so you can catch a lot of bugs this way. You can also do this via the command line. If you pass one of the following flags, there are more to the compiler, it will um, output the DAGs at a specific stage in the pipeline. Uh, you do have to make sure that LVM is built in debug mode um, for this graph functionality to be there. So be careful. So another issue that we've seen throughout the, uh, this journey is the cannot select error. And it is quite a common one, so we thought we'd cover it here. LVM spits this error out if it doesn't know how to map a DAG node to a machine instruction. We saw it earlier when we didn't know how to select a constant, for example. And so when you face with this error, um, I suggest checking the graph again. So if you've got this node that you're trying to select, lower it to a machine instruction, take a look at the node and its inputs and its types, and maybe something in your selection pattern or maybe even your C++ logic is wrong and it's mismatched. And so check the operands, the order, the types, et cetera. And you'll probably get to the issue pretty quickly. Uh, another common problem is you've created this new instruction. It's really great, except it doesn't make it to the end. Uh, something happens to it in the bubbles. Um, where did it go? Well, the common culprit would be maybe dead code elimination. This is LVM thinking, hey, this instruction doesn't do anything. I'm going to get rid of it. Ha -ha. Uh, so how can we combat this? Um, well, maybe. Your use def chains uh, aren't in order. Maybe you know, it's, there's nothing tying this node to anything that produces any result. Um, so again, check the graph, maybe. You can see sort of the, the chain of use def. Um, so if this doesn't work out, though, and you've got no real data dependency, uh, you could always just sort of go for the nuclear approach and use this. Um, the fact that dead code elimination won't touch anything that it sort of deems having side effects. And so, yeah, this will tell LLVM that, hey, I don't know what this instruction does. 
and it will just leave it there. And you'll, you know, it's a bit of a hack, but sometimes it's necessary. So check some table gen attributes such as may load, may store, has side effects, and they'll maybe get you out of your pickle. And so in terms of reading material, we've got a few links for you here. Uh, if you want to check out all the target hooks and the classes that you'll need to inherit from in your back end, check out this, uh, these target.h headers. Um, alternatively, they have doxygen documentation, which probably should be at the top of that list. Um, the table gen files, you're going to be, as you've probably noticed, working a lot with table gen. And so do check out these target.td files, uh, and they'll show you all the classes that you'll need to you know, custom to, um, sort of inherit from, all the fields that you can use to get your back end working. They're really useful. Uh, and alternatively, if you're working at the selection DAG level, at instruction selection, uh, check out isdopcodes.h, uh, and that will list all the target independent nodes that LVM will expect you to have some sort of either lowering or expansion or custom handling about. So yeah, they're really useful. And it is important to remember that no matter how late it is at night and how much your eyes hurt, that you are not, in fact, alone. And there are other people who have probably done the same thing as you. So help is at hand. Um, a good source of information is this tutorial I've, or this document I've uh, listed at the top of the slide, writing an LVM backend on the main website. Um, that will sort of give you a, a good tutorial, much like our one, on how to get started. And then another good source of information is other backends. There are quite a lot of them in the source repo. Uh, and they, you know, they all sort of share a bit of common functionality in a way. So have a we scout around and don't steal, but you know, get inspiration from. Uh, if you're really stuck, then there are a lot of useful um, and smart, helpful people on the LVM Dave mailing list. Do ask a question, and I'm sure it will get answered. Uh, with a smile. And we've got also a lot of tutorials, such as our one that we gave actually in April, um, how to build a backend. Um, there was sort of a tutorial on adding MC support to your uh, backend as well. So there's plenty of resources. Scout around. You're all right. And so <laughs> we've come to the end of our journey. Um, hopefully, what we've provided you with you today is a good start in getting your own backend up and running. Um, we've provided you with a lot of sort of tuto 10 minutes, really. I'll slow down. Uh, <laughs> I hope you've got questions. Um, we've walked you through an example backend, the bare bones functionality, and where we've not had time to uh, cover the advanced features, we've hopefully given you resources with which you can go further and uh, expand your simple target. Uh, yeah, we had to skip over a lot of stuff, as you can tell. There's many wings to this LVM dragon, and uh, sorry about that, maybe next time. And so thank you. Uh, I'm Fraser, this is Pierre. We'd be very happy to answer your questions now or later. I'll probably be by the buffet. Um, uh, you can email us, and you can obviously, please do check out our code on GitHub. Um, use it, fork it, rename it, whatever you want. It'll be fun, so thank you. Yeah, maybe. Does everyone have any, uh, does anyone have any questions? Do we have a person? Oh, do you have to go around? <laughs> Bye, Pierre. <laughs> You're still answering, right? Yeah, sure. So, like, digging through comments in some TD files, I've got an impression that table gen might support things like matching to different patterns to the same instruction, into the same instruction. Is it really possible, you know? Pardon? Uh, like. Okay, you had an example with sorry. You had an example with nested uh, pattern, n nested patterns mm -hmm. matched into one instruction. I'm talking about with different things, like two different patterns matched into the same instruction. Is it really possible with table gen? Do you know? Because I've just got su such impression, but I never saw. As far as I'm aware, it will probably try and match as many nodes as it can at one go. Yeah. And so if it fails that, then it will you know try sort of. Yeah, I think it, it tries to. Uh... Oh. It, just, <laughs> it, it tries to match as many nodes as possible, and then if it doesn't, then it just matches uh, fewer nodes. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand. I'm talking a bit 
about different oh, situations. You have to go and get there. All right, okay. Maybe we can <laughs> find it. Deepak, can you yes. maybe be a... I don't know how this thing works. Right, so uh, does this answer your question about uh, multiple instruction in the uh, pattern? Oh. <laughs> Come talk to us later. Yeah, we'll be around, so. Uh, any other question, maybe? No? Come on. Don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, how long do you anticipate a, you know, the things that you uh, sort of missed, how long do you think a, um, somebody would take to build a backend? Like, how long did it take you to, like, build your favorite backend? Or what's sort of a general estimate? Apparently, you can do it in 24 hours, according to know, the other tutorial. <laughs> uh, I think we probably took longer, right? Yeah, well, it, it really depends on your target, because, for example, if you have a simple, like, CPUs, and probably maybe scheduling is not, not so important for you, so you can omit it or just have a suboptimal version. But if you have a kind of like in order uh, processors, then scheduling is really important. And if you don't get it right, you'll get hazards and wrong results. So, or maybe you have a target with vectors or without vectors. So it really depends on your target. Leg didn't take long. Uh, no. A couple of days. Maybe. Question at the back. How much support is there in all the LLVM stuff for backends that either have no registers or arbitrary number of registers? Uh, I think PTX has an arbitrary number of registers. Is that right? Yeah. I'm not really sure. I how. don't know how they do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, no registers? I don't know. It's a good question. I guess no register is easier than out of registers, but. Uh. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. No, I, I don't know either, so sorry, don't know. Right. I think there was, was there someone over there? I don't know. No? All right. Oh, is that one? No? Oh, sorry. Oh, you're the one on that. I'm just curious how much time it took for you guys to uh, do the basic machinery in place, basic implementation where most of the programs are not coming back with cannot select and most of the functions are working as expected? Well, we are compiling really simple examples. So it didn't, I mean, most of the work was done by Fraser where you have to do all of the boilerplates, like create all of the files. And then at this point, you just create the registers and instructions. And once we are at this stage, it's uh, really fast to. Uh, create new instruction and make sure uh, your simple example will work. Right. So was it like a few weeks to get the instruction definitions and register classes and calling convention and all that? Or was it like days or months? Or? It was probably days. I mean, I didn't work full time. I had other stuff to do. But you know, where I had time, I'd put in an hour or something. But I'd, yeah, days at most. Okay. It's a very simple target. I mean, I've worked on bigger ones. Yeah, and the idea is that uh, we have I push this custom, like this really simple target to GitHub so you can just take the code and use it as a base for your targets and it gets much quicker because you don't have to do all of the boilerplate. Is there a simulator or how did you run the target code that you generated? Well, uh, yeah, well, one, one reason we base our code or target on ARM is that we can just use the uh, ARM tools to like disassemble it or look at it, run it. We have, I don't think we haven't done extensive testing on running the, I mean, they're useless examples really, they're contrived, but um, yeah. But yeah, you should be able to compile it into an ARM object and just push it to your favorite uh, ARM phone or device and just run them this way. And uh, LVM, our target can generate object uh, files, and then you can link them against existing objects and uh, call this function defined uh, through the compiler uh, with functions uh, compiled by another compiler. Assuming you want to add integers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Oh. Good. What's the time? Thank you. Thank you.